Earlier, I had the chance to talk with Chad Cunningham, Chief Investment Officer of the Conductor ETFs by Iron Horse Capital, about the company's international strategy, where he sees the economy going, and his bell ringing ceremony here at the New York Stock Exchange. We launched the ETF about a year and a half ago, and that was a really exciting moment for us. Here we are now, and what we've done is we've moved the listing down to the floor for better liquidity, better spreads for our clients. So. Uh, they've given us another opportunity uh, to do this, and uh, hopefully we make the most of it. So. What will this ETF invest in? So we're in the international space, international value, mostly small to mid-cap stocks. Uh, we're more systematic in approach, so we're not really reading financial documents and talking to management teams. We're really interested in relative valuation and relative performance among sectors and geographies. But international focus, for better, for worse, value focus, for better, for worse, um, and we just chug along and, and keep our heads down. and try to do the best thing we can do in a market that's been kind of tough for international stocks relative to the U.S., right? What are some of the biggest holdings in the ETF? We're heavily focused in Japan right now, Asia Pacific in general. We've seen our weighting in Europe uh, come up, um, kind of the equal weight levels relative to the overall international benchmarks. And we feel really good about that position long term in terms of sectors, have a lot of exposure to what I call kind of dirt on the hands type sectors, materials, energy, uh, asset heavy industrials type stuff and all that stuff is really undervalued right now on a relative basis. Um, we obviously have a very low exposure to stocks like IT stocks. We're not going to really be involved there unless we have another situation like the 2000s where that stuff gets really cheap over the course of a decade. And so again, hoping that there's some shifts in terms of money flows back towards what we're doing. Um, certainly don't want to root against certain markets or certain industries or certain companies, but it'd be nice if things like the Magnificent Seven <laughs> would, would pull back a little bit and allow us to have a little sunshine. You know? And what's the play on international versus the U.S.? What's behind that thesis? Well, when we originally started, we always thought about having you know, a globally diverse portfolio to really drive risk-adjusted return you know, through the cycle. And I always felt that was a great approach in terms of the opportunity set. Um, obviously, things swing back and forth over time. So if you look back to the 1990s, let's say the U.S. significantly outperformed. In the 2000s, international significantly outperformed. Um, over the past decade or decade and a half, U.S. has significantly outperformed again. So it's kind of like a basketball game, quarter to quarter. There's momentum one way or the other. Um, but I always felt like inter an international or global approach to investing was a better way to do things in terms of risk-adjusted returns for, for a client base. Obviously, people need diversification in their portfolio. So there's a place for us. As it stands right now, I think it's a particularly good time to look at international, especially international value, because a lot of international markets are significantly undervalued historically uh, relative to historic, you know, or significantly undervalued relative to the U.S. against historical levels. Do geopolitics impact your investments? Um, geopolitics, so we don't necessarily focus on qualitative factors or qualitative things like geopolitics. Um, it impacts us indirectly, obviously. So geopolitical issues are affecting price movement in particular markets and particular sectors that's obviously going to push us into names or pull us out of names or sectors or geographies but we're not focused on that um, on a daily basis for instance the situation last night is not affecting let's say my trading or decision making this morning for our viewers watching i know you referenced this and i was referencing it too when it came to geopolitics israel's response to iran's thwarted attack on israel last weekend and we'll see how and if Iran does respond. Uh, but ripple effects on oil prices uh, and other markets could be at play here. But I'm glad that you clarified in terms of what your strategy is, in terms of how that might indirectly impact your funds. So a perfect example is energy has been really undervalued for a while now. Historically, it's bounced off the lows, you know, the COVID lows, obviously. But even when you look against the historical valuation record, energy is still a pretty cheap sector relative to other sectors, in our opinion and in our work. So obviously I'm not really concerned about making a decision this morning based upon what happened last night, but let's say increased tension in the Middle East helps push up WTI crude and Brent crude prices in a, in a, as it relates to a sector that's already decently undervalued in our opinion. That's quite a bit of airspace for you know stocks in that space to move. So we're overweight energy in our portfolio. We've been kind of pushed there by relative valuation and some positive price dynamics in that space. And now we're prepared if there's something like that going to, maybe the market, the underlying currents in the market have kind of pushed us there for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of the way we think about it indirectly. What is your view on interest rates? We had seen the Fed in December of last year 
forecast three rate cuts this year. Now those have been dialed back. We might not see any rate cuts this year. Uh, yet at the same time, we're hearing that the ECB in Europe, for instance, might cut rates as soon as this summer. So I was always on the side of things. I thought the six, five or six rate cut idea that the markets were holding coming in this year was a little aggressive. Um, but I'm also not expecting, let's say, the 10 year in the U.S., for instance, to, to push far beyond 5%. Um, so I think structurally we're in a place where maybe the R star, the you know kind of the natural rate of interest, you know rates is probably a little higher than it was pre-COVID. But I you know I'm not expecting some sort of 70s style mm -hmm. breakout in terms of interest rates where we're going to double digit you know 10 years and that type of thing. That being said, um, you know with the Fed, I don't think it's going to be aggressive cutting rates this year. I don't think they can be. Um, I think maybe global central banks, like you said, may lead the way a little bit, but I don't expect wholesale cuts across the board. You know, I remember, you know, in late 2007, early 2008, the Fed famously said they thought everything was contained, that we'd have economic growth throughout 2008. By the, by the time you got to December of 2008, it was a completely different situation. Mm -hmm. um, the world was, was sinking rapidly, so. So where would that put us with that view in the economic cycle? Um, I think, I personally think we're late in the economic cycle. That's why I think in terms of rates increasing, that's going to be contained a little bit. That's why I have a hard time seeing interest rates on a nominal basis jumping past the 5% you know, level in the U.S. Um, I think interest rates historically, I mean, you've looked at the inverted yield curves. You think about how that feeds through the system. You look at, you know, let's say the leading economic indicators. You look at other indications that seem to suggest to me that in coming months or quarters, there's still the potential for a retrenchment in terms of U.S. economic growth.